Recall from a previous module that mitochondria are one of the two energy converting organelles in an eukaryotic cell, the other organelle being a chloroplast. Students often think that plants contain chloroplasts and animals contain mitochondria, but this is untrue. All eukaryotic cells contain mitochondria, plants included. Let's focus on the structure of one of these organelles. Mitochondria are these little jelly bean shaped organelles and they are always orange in any book from which I've ever taught. Each mitochondrion has a double membrane, which makes a structure like a bag in a bag. But think of the inner bag. It's all wrinkled and it doesn't fit into the outer bag perfectly. This is true. The inner membrane has much more surface area for what you can see here in the bottom left corner are enzymes embedded in the inner membrane. The inner membrane is filled with a gooey substance of enzymes called the matrix. Between the membranes is a space that we call the intermembrane space. The prefix means between, whereas intra means within. And then remember, this isn't a cell. So this organelle would be found in the cytoplasm of a cell. They are very common in muscle cells, also called muscle fibers, where you require a massive amount of energy conversion to power the contractions. So moving from the outside to the inside of a mitochondrion, you would encounter the outer membrane, then the intermembrane space, then the inner membrane, and then the gooey matrix. Phosphorylation in general, it, it's the process of generating ATP. There are three types of phosphorylation and the names indicate what's used in the process of generating the ATP. You have to, you have to think of ATP as like a, a coiled spring. Coiling or compressing that spring is the process called phosphorylation, right? And when that energy trapped in the ATP, when it's used, the ATP goes through a process called hydrolysis in which a water molecule is used to split one of the phosphate groups off of the ATP, making it into ADP. When you eat food, the process of coiling the spring happens. Again, as energy from your food is used to bond that last phosphate group to the ADP to make ATP. So, you're, you're just one big a ATP recycling bin, right? Substrate phosphorylation occurs with an enzyme and it makes very little ATP, not enough to power many eukaryotic cells. Oxidative phosphorylation uses oxygen and a specific enzyme called ATP synthase, which is embedded in the inner membrane of your mitochondria. And in this process, it makes a lot of ATP very quickly. The final type, photophosphorylation, it, it uses light and it's discussed with phos photosynthesis in the next module. Redox reactions, they're pretty simple. In biology, I mean, they're simple. They get a bit more complex if you take chemistry, um, but this is not chemistry. <laughs> so I'll keep it simple. This concept, it's deceptive because it uses a word with which you are already familiar, reduction. Don't neglect the significance of this word here, to reduce, to become more negative, which would also be like to gain a negative charge or to gain electrons. Of course, if we have a molecule accepting an electron, or being reduced, the electron, I mean, <laughs> it's gotta come from somewhere, right? And, and yes, it would come from a donor who by losing the electrons becomes more positive or oxidized. Glucose is our electron donor in cellular respiration. When glucose becomes oxidized, it, in many steps, turns into carbon dioxide. Molecular oxygen here, um, the gas, is our electron acceptor. When it becomes reduced, 
it turns into water. Understanding electron infidelity, it's really important in regarding or reading the chapter um, and understanding the rest of what we're going to talk about with cellular respiration. I, th I mean, think of what a hydrogen atom is. It's just one proton surrounded by one electron and there's no neutrons, right? And so the problem is that every other atom that's out there that isn't a hydrogen atom, it has more protons, right? So that one lonely electron is unfaithful. It sees all of the other atoms and ions out there that have more positive charges, and it's attracted to all of those other atoms or ions, right? So therefore, we refer to a hydrogen as a hydrogen ion, a hydrogen cation, or sometimes it's even just referred to as a proton. If the electron leaves, then all that's left is this nucleus with one proton in it, right? And, and essentially what we have is, uh, just a, a hydrogen cation. When we get into cellular respiration, um, we're gonna find out that there are three significant steps. And the first of these steps, it occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. And then the second and third, it occurs in the mitochondria. So during, during the first step, electrons, they're stripped from the glucose and this electron stripping, it continues in the second step in the mitochondria. Yeah, but those electrons from the first and second step, they're, they're used in the third step that's also in the mitochondria. Regardless of location here, the problem is transporting the electrons between the first and the third step and between the second and the third step. Electrons, they can, just float about freely. I, I mean, they can, but they'll never really get to where they're going. So what we have is kind of like an usher or a taxi for these electrons. There are many analogies out there to explain how electrons are taxied from one location to another location inside of a cell. I like this analogy with this actual taxi in the picture, <laughs> right? The taxi is a molecule called NAD plus, indicating that it's a cation and that it's lost an electron somewhere, don't worry about where. These two people here, they're the two electrons, right? So these are the electrons that have been stripped from glucose and other breakdown compounds from the first and second step of cellular respiration. The electrons are the people, they're loaded into the taxi and this changes the taxi from NAD plus to NADH. The diagram at the bottom, it shows you that when the electrons are loaded into NAD+, the hydrogen protons, they, they kind of like, they also come along. Just work with me, they just come along. These taxis, they then, they take all of these substances from one area of the cell, like in the cytoplasm, into the mitochondria, or from one area of the mitochondria into another area. Once the taxi gets to its destination, it can offload the electrons and it turns back into NAD+, which then circles back to pick up more electrons, turning into NADH, going back to the electron, and it's just a big cycle. 